Hi. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you about design systems and component libraries at Spotify, where I work. So it's 2019. There are a lot of design systems. People talk about it a lot. When I was uh, researching this talk, I discovered even astronauts have design systems, which I thought was pretty cool. And also, in this conference, there are going to be a lot of talks about it. Um, at Spotify, we've had our design system for about six years now, which is a very long time for design systems. And in that time, we got a lot of experience with this kind of system at scale um, Yeah, in a big company. So today is really about sharing uh, from the experience and from what we learned. And the way it's going to go, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the journey we've been on. I'm going to focus on three very specific learnings that we had. And then I'm going to tell you a bit about this new approach that we're taking right now. And all throughout the talk, I have these blue slides for takeaways. And these are things that I think are probably relevant in contexts that are outside of Spotify and things that you can remember uh, from this talk. Cool. So our journey. Um, let me take you back to 2012. Spotify was a slightly different shade of green and slightly different font. And Spotify has always been a big believer in this idea of autonomy. Uh, we believe that it's up to the company to sort of frame the problems, but it's really these sort of individual cross-functional teams that are best suited to figure out how to solve these problems. And we want these teams to be as independent as possible. Melvin Conway is a very famous computer scientist. He coined Conway's law, which says that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the structures of these organizations. And if we have an organization where we have all of these independent teams solving problems on their own, we end up, this is like what Spotify looked like in 2012. It was a lot of different screens. Everything looked a bit different. And you can kind of tell which team was working on it. So in 2013, we figured out that this is a problem and that we want to make everything feel connected. And we wanted to do that both for like better speed of development, both for our users to make their experience more like less of a learning curve to learn how to use the product, and also to have this like single brand voice across all of the apps that we have. So we call this project Project Cat, and it was a really big project. All of these people worked on it, and they went through every single one of those screens and made it look consistent with a certain design language. So yeah, they made Spotify look like this, which should be more familiar, the sort of dark aesthetic with uh, green accents. And it was such a difficult like, process to do. They, they had to do this for every single screen. So once this work was done and we had something that was consistent, the question was, how do we maintain this consistency over time? And the answer was is that we created a design system. And we gave it a very catchy name, uh, Global Language for Unified Experience, which is kind of like a forced acronym for GLUE, uh, which is more catchy. And GLUE is basically a collection of designs, documentation, and code. GLUE followed uh, an atomic design model, which is uh, not original for Spotify, but it's a way of having this mental model to reason about the components that you have. So the smallest building blocks are atoms. These are things like fonts, um, sort of various styles. One layer up, we have molecules, which is sort of when, what happens when atoms come together. These are more things like buttons and cards. And then we have uh, organisms, which are like more complex uh, components. So for us, it's headers. Another very nice thing that the Glue, did, uh, Glue team did was create this reference app. So we have a reference app on iOS and Android, which is a catalog of all of the components. And it's uh, very useful for designers and product people to know what's available, and also for engineers to know how to implement the various components. So this is all pretty good. And then time passes. So we fast forward to 2017, where we start seeing some issues with the way things were set up. So one of the issues was that feature teams were asking the Glue team to build their components for them, because they didn't feel confident enough to create UI and own it. And there wasn't really a clear understanding of when a component should be part of the component library or when it's just something that a team should make themselves. 
On the other side of this, the Glue team, when they wanted to have a system-wide change that they wanted to push uh, across the app, they would have to ask every feature team to update their feature and use the new component they created. Um, and often the teams would like, reject this and say that, oh, they have a high priority thing to do, or that there's an A-B test that this kind of change may conflict or ruin. Um, so it was very hard for the Glue team to do stuff. They became this bottleneck that created the UI for the company, uh, and they couldn't drive the changes that they wanted to drive in the app. Um, so what happens when, when this is the situation? It becomes harder and harder to argue that this team should have all these 20 people that we saw before. And the Glue team started moving around different parts of the company and losing engineers to um, higher profile projects that we had. There are some consequences to this, so, uh, which you can see in the product. So we have some deviations. This is from the app, the artist page and the playlist page look a little bit different, and they look a little bit different because of this situation, uh, where the component library is not as well maintained as it should be. Uh, we also saw a lot of duplicated efforts. So uh, the smaller card that you see is uh, a glue component that we have in the component library. But the big card is uh, one team needed a slightly bigger card, and there was no way for them to do that with the component that we had. So they had to spend the time to create their own big card component. And it doesn't really share a lot of things with the small card, and they spend almost a week on it. So it, these kind of things over time really slow us down. The other thing that we saw is that things that didn't really belong in the component library ended up in the component library. So we had like a reader, writer, mutable dictionary, and some subview search functions, various helpers for maths and sharing uh, and shape drawing. And the reason they ended up there is because it was kind of a convenient place to put some shared code. And again, there wasn't really clear guideline for what did belong in the component library. So it was a bit of a free-for-all, and if you had something that you wanted to share across apps, you just put it there. So it became evident that we needed a new approach. Uh, but before we can go into a new approach, I want to focus on three learnings from the experience that we had. So the first learning is about rows. Uh, rows is one of the main components that we have. We have a lot of rows in the app. So we have rows for albums, for playlists, for artists, tracks, uh, calendar, um, um, concerts, radio, a lot of rows. And if you focus on a specific row, it looks like this, oh, it used to, um, and you have this sort of engineering hat on, you say, oh, this is, they all pretty much follow the same pattern. There's kind of like a view on the left, a title, a subtitle, and a view on the right. And as engineers, we kind of have this idea that we don't repeat ourselves, we want to reuse code as much as possible. So instead of creating a playlist row, a track row, a podcast row, a concert row, radio row, et cetera, we created, on iOS, we have an entity row, which is like one big abstraction that kind of changes based on the different situations. And on Android, we ended up with a two-line row, which is also pretty much the other side of the abstraction. And this is great if you want to write less code. But the problem is, how do you make changes? Because once you've created these components, they get distributed and used throughout the app by a lot of teams in various parts of the world. And say you want to change the way you present a podcast episode. What do you do? You start adding if statements to your components. And over time, this becomes a lot more complicated. And the simple abstraction that you had becomes harder and harder to maintain and harder and harder to make changes. So, the first lesson that we had is that we should put our sort of engineering skills to the side a little bit and really focus on evolvability rather than writing as little code as possible. So I prefer evolvability over reuse. Right. Design systems are a bit like sharks. Um, so they can be scary sometimes, but also they, some sharks need to keep moving to stay alive, and design systems need continued work uh, to, to thrive and to uh, deliver value. So how do we prevent the situation that we had where the design team, uh, the glue team would just keep moving around different departments and lose people? How do we keep the teams funded? One thing people often forget is that design systems are products, like all other products. Uh, we have our users are both end users of the app, but also internal users, like developers and designers. And yeah, so I have this on my desk to remind me that design systems are products. Um, but 
the way we can determine the value of this product is the same way we determine the value of other products. So we can run surveys like net promoter scores with developers and designers to show the value that the component library and the design system brings to them. Uh, we can do user research to uh, really show that the changes that we're making are making the user experience a lot more enjoyable and task completion increases for users. And we can also do A-B testing. And I think people are a little bit suspicious when you talk about A-B testing design and they think about like very small tests where you test like a slightly different shade of blue and see what kind of impact it has. Um, but really for like the kind of changes that we want to do in the component library and the kind of evolution that we want to have, we want to make the app simpler and we want to make the app more coherent for users. And in theory, that should impact the metrics that the company cares about, like retention and engagement and activation and growth. Um, and when you're able to prove that design system changes are making this kind of impact in the app, it becomes a lot easier to argue for more people, uh, more resources, and, and keeping the system alive and thriving. So our second takeaway is that we really need to measure and communicate user value frequently in order to keep these design systems thriving and alive. The last one is generally when we have these conversations around what kind of design system and component library we want to have, there's this idea that we need to make some kind of a trade-off between autonomy and consistency. On the autonomy side, we need autonomy because we're not always solving the same old problems that we solved before. So we have new problems to solve, and it makes sense that we will need new components and new designs to solve them. At the same time, the world around us is changing, and it could be that the old solutions that we had are no longer valid, or if it's just design, maybe like design trends have changed and our app is looking outdated. On the other side, we do really need consistency. Um, the whole value of a component library comes from consistency, and we need to maintain this coherency over time to keep the design system valuable. The more exceptions you have to the design system of a component library, the less valuable it is. So our learning was that they're really not mutually exclusive. You don't have to choose between autonomy and consistency. And what we're trying to do is basically find an architecture that allows us to do both when it makes sense. And that's the sort of third takeaway. So what's this new approach that we're taking? So there's several elements to this. In order to get there, we consolidated these learnings that we had. We set up a work group with representatives from different parts of the company. And we had stakeholder interviews with all of the people who are using the component library and with uh, user researchers, et cetera. And the first new thing that we have is tokens. So tokens they enable the scalable system-wide changes that we couldn't do before. Uh, this is not an original idea for us. We were inspired by Salesforce. And with tokens, you basically take a lot of the decisions that are common to all the apps and platforms that we make and put them in a JSON file. And then we use code generation to take these decisions and have generate implementations of them for the platforms that we have. So we have from a JSON, we create code for iOS, for Android, and we even create, like, automatically update our design toolkit uh, through Sketch and Abstract. At the moment, the kind of decisions that we have in the tokens are things like color and typography, but we're looking into ways to move more and more of our decisions to that layer. What it means, it's, it's very, very powerful. You can take one small change with one line and one deploy. We can do crazy things like change all of the buttons in Spotify to purple. Uh, across all of the apps that we have. Um, I mean, we wouldn't want to do that, but the ability to do something like this is really, really powerful. The next thing we're trying to do is we had this component library and a component library team. And our original vision was to have one big team working together on this because we wanted uh, all of the platforms to be more or less in line with each other. And this kind of makes sense when you think of Spotify as just the music and podcast app that people know, but we actually have more apps. We have uh, Spotify for Artists, which is an app that artists are using to see stats and connect with their fans. And we have this experiment now in Australia and the US, Spotify Stations, which is um, another way of listening to music. And not only that, not only do we have these apps, but we also are on a lot of platforms. We have Spotify on many cars, um, on TVs, and like my favorite one is the Fridge app. 
No. Um, so all these platforms, and it's really not feasible for one team to scale to all of these different platforms. So instead of having a component library team, we realize we need component libraries. And the way this works is that we have like different layers. So we have, at the bottom layer, we have uh, the foundation layer, which is mainly the tokens that we talked about. And here we have things like colors, fonts, and values. Next layer up, we have component libraries that are specific to a platform, but not specific to any app or domain. So these are like iOS uh, component library, Android, web. And they contain elements, uh, which are sort of the smaller building blocks. Uh, they contain theming utilities, things around motion, generally the kind of stuff that we want to share that's really not specific. And the next layer up, we have the domain-specific, app-specific component libraries. And this is where we have the reusable components. And the way it works in practice is that each of these layers encapsulates the layer below it, and each of them is being worked on by a different team. And all of them are kind of combining their forces together to make all of this coherent. The next idea is semantic meaning. So if you think about this entity row that we had, um, how do we limit the side effects? How do we prefer evolvability to reuse? So we're using this idea of semantic meanings of basically defining components by what they represent and not what they look like, with the idea that what they represent is something that will last way longer than the current way that they look like over time. So a super simple example of that is this bicycle. You could have an abstraction over a bicycle to say that it's a two-wheel vehicle. But that abstraction applies to many different things. Uh, and we will much benefit over time by really calling a bicycle a bicycle. Or in our case, the entity row really should become a playlist row, track row, podcast row, concert row, etc. This really helps tech, product, and design have better conversations, because before, when we wanted to make a change, we would have to explain that on Android we had this two-line row, on iOS we had this entity row, and it's really hard for people to really understand the differences between the different abstractions that we had. But if the abstraction is closer to what the thing actually represents, it's much easier to discuss. So this idea actually extends beyond components. So you can use semantic definitions for colors and fonts. Uh, in September, Apple is going to launch dark mode on iOS. And the way dark mode is implemented is basically by Apple defining these semantic colors on the system, things like grid color, highlight color, label color, and defining how these colors change based on the different mode of the device. How do you, fight the, how do you find the right granularity? Uh, it's not easy. It's definitely more of an art than a science. But I think practice and doing this over time really helps you develop that skill. Uh, ultimately, it's about really keeping in mind this ability to make changes that are isolated to a specific context. But it will take some trial and error to get them. We have this idea of an override function. So at this point, after having a component library for six years, I think we're mature enough to admit the deviations, even though we don't want them, will happen. So they will happen because of the reasons I mentioned around the, the changing world around us and exploring new kind of problems, but also because we're working with people, and people are not great at following rules. So we know this will happen. And what we need to know in order to maintain the coherence of the system is we need to know why it happens. So the override function is basically a single place where we, as maintainers, can see all of the different customizations and, and different implementations that people are having for a single semantic meaning. So I'm going to show you like, a super basic implementation of it. Uh, so this is when we create a track row. We have a make uh, function. And if you don't supply anything, you will get the default track row component, which is the current latest one that we ship with the design system. However, if you pass a specific configuration, you can do whatever you want within, within that switch case. So in this case, the search feature can pass a make for search and pass the specific implementation of the component. What this allows us to do is to continue evolving the default component, because we, we want the default component to cover the majority of use cases that exist. And when we know that what we have doesn't cover the search use case, then we're able to evolve it to make sure that it's still relevant. 
It gives teams the autonomy to pursue basically whatever design they're after, because within that switch case, they can do whatever they want. And we're also going to build some special tools to help make the more common customizations easier within that switch case. It allows for A-B testing, so we can help prove the value of the changes that we make, because we can pass a, configura a configuration for our A-B test with a, maybe a Boolean value. And it allows us to make system-wide changes by switching the default component that we have. What all of this basically comes together to is this idea that we want to have a clear contract with teams. Before, what we gave teams was a collection of components. And what we want to give teams now is the current best representation of a semantic meaning. We will work hard to help teams be faster and focus on the things that really matter, uh, which is the functionality of their features. And for the components that we supply, for the default ones, we're going to guarantee the quality of the components, making sure that we think about accessibility, right to left, all of these things that really take time. Um, we're we're going to maintain it. So when uh, iOS introduces something new or Android introduces something new, we'll keep these things up to date. And also, we have this idea of translation. So our team, we don't only do the code and design side, we also have the design toolkit. And for the default components that we have, we really want to reduce the work needed to hand off designs and implement them in code. And we do that by making sure that the way designers uh, adjust and customize the components is very similar to the way developers can do it in code. So having very similar APIs, both on Sketch and in code. Uh, and at the same time, while we give all of this value, teams can deviate easily if they want to. Uh, but all they need to do is just do it the right way and do it in a way that's traceable and accountable and that we can later integrate into the component library. So to wrap up, um, one of the main ideas is we really want to try and use semantic meanings as, as often as possible. We think it's much more scalable and sort of time-proof for the future. We want to create an architecture that allows autonomy and consistency, and we believe this idea of an override function can help us get there. We want to measure and communicate user values frequently so we can keep this design system alive and thriving for a long time. And we really want to set clear expectations with feature teams to avoid the kind of situation that we had in the past. Some disclaimers. Um, so you should not try all of these at home. Uh, where we got right now is basically based on Spotify and the kind of work that we're doing. And while some of these ideas can serve as inspiration and be relevant, it's really not about just like saying, oh, this is the way we should do things. And another disclaimer is that also some of this new approach is still work in progress. So we're still settling on the exact implementation of an override function. And we're still figuring stuff out. So over the last year, six years, we've learned a lot, and we've really evolved the way that we approach design system and component libraries. And I wanted to end with this kind of like open question and looking forward to the next six years and what will we learn. Uh, this is still very early days for these kind of systems, and I think the way we will look back in six years' time, we might uh, question everything that we believe in now. And that's it. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Roy. So we've got some questions for you, um, cool. but I keep forgetting to do this. So let me just say first that uh, I do believe most of the slides and videos will be available afterwards. So sorry for not getting to that earlier. Um, but I think there will be a little delay, not, not straight away. Um, so questions for you, Roy. Yeah. Um, this is an interesting one. Obviously, Spotify is on like everything from fridges to whatever. Mm -hmm. um, how do you basically manage the system at that scale when you think about all these different platforms and all these different places it might come up? Yeah. So we're trying this layering approach in order to manage it and passing more and more of the decisions down to the lowest layers that we can translate to all of these different platforms. Um, and when you think about uh, snapshotting, uh, how do you yes. test those components? Is your snapshot uh, applied to Empire pages, uh, different services, views, platforms? How do you handle that? Yeah, so at the moment, we're still very new to snapshot testing at Spotify. Uh, we're going to snapshot all of the components uh, within the reusable component layer. Uh, but we're, at the moment, we're not snapshotting whole screens and whole pages. And we hope to do that in the future. 
You mentioned one of the core responsibilities is actually keeping it up to date on all yep. the platforms. Uh, how quickly is that contract between when WWDC comes out or I.O.? Mm -hmm. How quickly do you have to react to that? Um, ideally, as quickly as possible. The thing is, at the same time, we have an app that's used by hundreds of millions of people, and we can't just drop old versions. So, for example, we're very excited about SwiftUI, but the, by the time we're able to use it, we'll be, it's the time when we feel confident in dropping iOS 12, and I think that will be a while from now. Um, in terms of the design system, uh, what kind of are the core tools that Spotify uses? Um, so designers are using Sketch and Abstract a lot. Um, Developers, we do most of the stuff natively on mobile. Um, we use React for some prototyping. Yeah. Is there any part of the, the tech stack that's open source that people can look at in terms of like sketch scripts or anything else like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Easy one. It would be nice if it was. Um, yeah, we'll see. Um, in terms of owning the design system, uh, what, who, who gets, actually gets to make that final say? Who's the person who's driving that? In what way? <laughs> um, let's see. The question is, if there isn't a team in charge of, it, of something in particular, is it mm -hmm. feasible to have one person accountable, or is it more distributed? It's more distributed for us. So we have the team that owns the, the tokens layer. They make decisions that affect the tokens layer, and they have the mandate to do that for the whole of Spotify. Then the iOS layer has the remits and the app-specific layers can make those decisions. So it's, it's also very layered. So we all know one of the biggest challenges in, in, in uh, developers is naming things. Yeah. Uh, so what is the best way to name colors, for example? Do you get very semantic, or do you typically think of things more like where they are contextually? Yeah, so what we're doing now is we have, uh, we have a very uh, color-based naming. So we have things like uh, gray 7 or gray 70. And then the abstraction that the teams are using are, should be things more like background color or primary color, secondary color, tertiary color. So. Um, what tools specifically for code generation are you looking at? Uh, we script. We have our own script. That does that. That's no, no specific tool. OK. Um, let's see. Ah, here's an interesting one. Uh, when it comes to different platforms, mm -hmm. uh, especially in terms of different components feeling different, how important do you feel like that is? Or do you think it's even necessary in 2019 to have sort of iOS, Android, et cetera? Yeah. So we believe that we want all of our apps to look more or less similar. Because we know a lot of our users are using Spotify on more than one platform. And we want things to feel familiar and that, to keep that learning curve low across all of these platforms. So for us, it's very important. But I think if it depends on your app. Like if you have an app that people are mostly using on one platform, then maybe it's less important for you. Another question on um, basically uh, less permanent things inside of the UI. So temporary components, maybe campaigns, one-offs, mm -hmm. special uh, you know, commemorative days or holidays, anything like yeah. that. So that, those components, teams should be able to create for themselves. Uh, we have a definition of a component, uh, kind of like a schema. And the, we hope that the teams can follow the way we build components for the component library when they're building components on themselves. And that way, at some point, we can promote those components into the component library. Um, but yeah, teams are still free to do things that, that they want that for semantic meanings that we're not covering in the component library. And what happens, uh, like maybe you can also talk about the process to getting a new component into the design system. Um, at the moment, it's still not super clear. But like, yeah, by having components, the components outside the, comp the, the system be similar to the ones in the system, we hope that will be easier. But we don't have a set process yet. But we'll work on it. Uh, two more process questions. Uh, yeah. How do you document the system? Mm -hmm. And also, how do you sort of get buy-in from different parts of the organization? Yeah. So the documentation, we're trying to automate as much as possible. So we're trying to define um, the components in ways that can basically power the documentation and use the snapshot tests to be the documentation, and also trying out playgrounds and uh, other things that are available. 
Um, and the second question was about? Getting buy-in. Getting buy-in. So yes, yeah, so it is about basically shipping and proving that we're making these, uh, this impact on the metrics that the company cares about. And then it's, it's way easier to, to get buy-in from everyone. Um, and maybe one more philosophical question is, yeah. like, who do you think uh, benefits from a uh, design system? Is it everybody equally? You mentioned a lot of engineering things, but mm -hmm. does design also benefit? Does product benefit? I think everyone benefits, yeah. And the users, too, the end users as well. And is that the reason to do it? Like, what's the, what's the best reason to do this? It's really about, like, maintaining consistency for users and for developers, uh, making the teams faster, those are the main reasons. Okay, great. Thanks, Roy. Cool. Thanks.